Hello, and welcome to a real doozy of a chapter, The Great Gatsby, Chapter 7. This is the chapter of payoffs. Everything we've been building up, everything we've been accreting, will culminate in this chapter. And what we'll do to focus in is look at illusion, minor characters, I'm going to offer an idea of using them to interpret um, repetition, and kind of larger discussion of love versus intimacy. Let's get started though with a reminder of chapter six. In that chapter, one of the main things we focused on was the creation, the self-creation of Jay Gatsby out of James Gats, taking this Minnesotan and turning him into a member of New Money. We also discussed the difference between the narrator versus the novelist, right? The narrator is Nick Carraway, but the novelist is F. Scott Fitzgerald, and we were careful not to conflate the two of those. We also discussed frontier metaphors. And in reference to this, I want to draw your attention to the Pulitzer Prize winner of just yesterday, The End of Myth, The End of the Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America by Greg Grandin. In this book, you'll notice that direct article, The Myth, The Myth of the Western Frontier, of white American settler colonialism going out, right? And so just to let you know, these things that we talk about in class in reference to the Great Gatsby are part of an ongoing conversation. And so you're laying the groundwork to be part of a much larger conversation for the rest of your lives. And then we finally, we discussed um, Gatsby and Daisy's kiss at the end of chapter six. I wanna remind you about something we talked about in reference to chapter four, which is, this idea of the Aristotelian tragedy, namely uh, that a tragedy, a good tragedy, should be self-contained in time, place, and action. And that chapter we looked at took place over a course of one day. In the same way, this chapter will also do that. After a brief setup, we learn uh, this, give, this invitation, would I come up to lunch at her house tomorrow, which is Monday, and then the chapter ends, the last time frame we have a mention of is Jordan saying, it's only half past nine, at which point there's a very brief moment that concludes the chapter. So the entire thing is very self-contained. There are also five distinct act breaks, which are indicated by blank space on the page. Remember, the way I talk about that is it's an invitation to mentally shift yourself in time and space. And so space in a book is valuable. So by giving you that blank space, it says to the reader, hey, something new is happening, right? I want you to pause, but not shift to a new chapter. So a quick summary. After a long setup, we get everybody into different cars driving into Manhattan. At this point, tensions are mounting. There's a long conflict in the Plaza Hotel, at which point everybody leaves in different cars. Then we have the short revelation of Myrtle's death, which I'll discuss as being a moment of climax. Um, and then we have a little bit longer section of Tom questioning Wilson, which I'm hardly gonna look at at all. And then we have a similar length of time as the evening settles down. The thing I wanna start with though, is that we open with a classical illusion, a classical literary illusion. From the very first sentence then, we're being invited to think about this book, The Great Gatsby, in terms of a history of literature that kind of gives its genealogy to the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, right? We had the first mythological allusion to Midas, Mycenaeus, which was Roman, and then Morgan, creating this genealogy of Western inheritance, which is highly problematic, but it's also what underpins the entire idea of Manifest Destiny and Western Expansion. If you take my myth class, we're gonna talk about this a lot in relation to Percy Jackson. So chapter seven opens. It was when curiosity about Gatsby was at its highest that the lights in his house failed to go on one Saturday night. And as obscurely as it had begun, his career as Trimalchio was over. There's this idea in Aristotelian tragic theory that something that a character undergoes is what's called the great turning. And they, the character will be at their highest point of authority and position, and then something will happen, a revelation, and suddenly they'll tumble to the bottom. And so here, we have curiosity at its highest, and then we have a failure of light. 
And that darkness shifts into obscurity. So out of darkness he came and back into darkness he goes. But specifically what's interesting is the career as Trimalchio. So Trimalchio is a reference to a character in a fellow named Petronius's Latin novel called the Satyricon. This novel was written in the period of Nero's reign, which was from 54 to 68 CE. Nero, of course, being characterized as a, um, an extravagant emperor, an emperor that did enjoy a party. He's no Caligula, but he has his own baggage. Uh, Trimalchio is part of a section in this book called the Cana Trimalchionis, which is just um, dinner at Trimalchio's house. So here's why the illusion is appropriate. And this is something you always have to go with, right? If you have um, an opposite illusion, a fitting illusion, then you can really use it to understand what's going on in the novel. So let's unpack this a little bit. Trimalchio was a massively wealthy freedman. A freedman is a former slave who either purchased his or her their own manumission or was manumitted by their owner. So what does this mean? Well, remember how I just said this book was written under Nero? You could have written a book where you situated it and Nero was throwing a party, right? It could have said, oh, and his career as a Nero was over. That would be a very different illusion, illusion, right? So Tomalchio is a lower class person that's gotten new money in order to be able to aspire to aristocratic pretensions. Sound familiar? It should sound exactly familiar because it's what Gatsby's doing with old money versus new money. During this dinner, uh, Trimalchio shares a story about when he visited the Sibyl of Kumai. The Sibyl of Kumai is a sort of prophet who was given um, the gift of foresight from Apollo. You are going to hear a lot more about this Sibyl when you take year one seminar and we read the Aeneid, as well as uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, because these lines from Protonius' novel are actually the epigraph of The Wasteland. So put into your Google Calendar that a year and a half from now, you should be reminded of this, and we'll be talking about it in class. Nam sibilam quidem cumis ego ipsen, oculis meis vidi in ampula pendere, et cum illi pueri dicerent. Sibula titeles, respondeva ad illa, apopanen fellow. For I indeed once saw with my own eyes the Sybil at Kumai hanging in her jar. And when the boys asked her, Sybil, what do you want? She answered, I want to die. Other stories at this dinner include supernatural tales of werewolves and witches. The entire thing ends with a staged funeral. So what we have is a huge party. It's going to culminate in a death. It features people that don't want to be in the position that they are forced to play. Everything about this one word, one word, Trimalchio, is conjuring all of this baggage that we carry with us. Suddenly we're thinking about the ideas of parties, of death, of performativity, of wealth, of being a prophet, of not, of knowing how time works, right? The Sybil is a person that has lived forever. That's why she wants to die. She's lived too long. And that'll come up. We've already been talking about time. Right? This is when illusions get exciting, is when the more weight you put on them, the more you gain from them. Let's keep going. The poem, the poem, chapter seven opens with a lot of heat. Look at everything here, except for a weary bend, is all kind of repetitions of heat, heat, hot, shimmering, combustion. That word combustion is going to come back. Pay attention to that. Glistening, sweat, damp, hot, hot, hot. We're ramping up the heat in this chapter. And of course, the more heat you have, the more you expect that heat to go somewhere. That's the entire weight of this novel has propelled us forward. We're shoving forward. We're getting all of this information. All of these new tensions are rising. And we're right now in chapter seven, experiencing them. And we have an early debate about time cyclicity. What do we do with ourselves this afternoon? Cried Daisy. And the day after that, and the day in the next 30 years. Don't be morbid, Gordon said. Life starts all over again when it gets crisp in the fall. But it's so hot, insisted Daisy, on the verge of tears, and everything's so confused. Let's all go to town. Her voice struggled on through the heat, beating against it, molding its senselessness into forms. I've heard of making a stable, a garage out of a stable, 
Tom was saying to Gatsby, but I'm the first man who ever made a stable out of a garage. What we have here are three different views on time. We have Daisy and her view of time of the day after and next. Daisy's view of time is linear going forward. Jordan says life starts all over again. Jordan's view of time is cyclical, that it's a wheel, it starts over. And then you get Tom talking to Gatsby of making a garage out of a stable. Tom's view of time is reverse, right? Stables are where you have your horses, and then you get the invention of the automobile, and then you have garages. But Tom is saying, hey, I'm going back. I'm looking backward. And of course, this is also a reflection of horses and the uh, representation of old money. Right? Remember how last week we talked that Gatsby has no horses because that's not a part of new money. So right now we're in the midst of three different types of debate about time. And what do you remember about Gatsby last week? What did he want to do? Well, he wanted to turn back time. He wanted to eliminate time to start it over. And don't worry, that'll come up. This is the point at which we're starting to establish the major conflict of this chapter, which is the kind of constant theme of whom does Daisy love? Their eyes met and they stared together at each other, alone in space. With an effort, she glanced down at the table. You always look so cool, she repeated. She had told him that she loved him and Tom Buchanan saw. He was astounded. His mouth opened a little and he looked at Gatsby and then back at Daisy as if he had just recognized her as someone he knew a long time ago. Here we have this moment of recognition. Notice though that what, you know, what she says is, you always look so cool. And in doing this, she's told him that she loves him. Tom Buchanan suddenly recognizes there's something there. How do you know? Always. All of that weight on is indicative of how long they've known each other. It's an always moment. As soon as he hears this, he's looking at Gatsby and then back at Daisy and he recognizes, notice all of these RE prefixes, those have to do with repetition, doing something again and again and again. And suddenly Tom is thrown into the past, someone he knew long ago. One of the things that I mentioned about this chapter is that this is the chapter of payoffs. Here is the reward, the payoff of all of that attention we've been paying to Daisy's voice. Right? From chapter one, we've been thinking, marking Daisy's voice. It's always there. Everybody's commenting on it. And suddenly here it is. Gatsby turned to me rigidly. I can't say anything in this his household sport. She's got an indiscreet voice, I remarked. It's full of, I hesitated. Her voice is full of money, he said suddenly. That was it. I'd never understood before. It was full of money. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it, the jingle of it, the symbol's song of it. High in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. All right, this is a stunning moment. Notice how it starts with this idea of speech. Gatsby says, I can't say anything in this his house, and he uses his favorite affectation, old sport. Nick then says it's indiscreet voice, right? Maybe it's a little bit too loud. It, it doesn't pitch itself properly. And he's trying to say it's full of, and notice he goes silent. Chapter six also ended with his silence. Nothing filled that silence though. And now Gatsby fills that silence. We learn her voice is full of money. She is born to wealth. She is the epitome of old money and he can never match it because he's using dated, outdated affectations to try to appear to have wealth and money, but he's not born to it. And that's that different, almost an accent of money. And this is a revelation to Nick. I never understood it before. And then he develops this idea from a jingle to a cymbal song, like picking up all of this music language until he culminates in high in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. Remember when I was talking about those mythological illusions earlier, and I mentioned the one from chapter one, Midas, Mycenaeus, and Morgan? Midas, he was the person that turned everything to gold, and the last thing he turned to gold before he tried to reverse his spell was his daughter when she jumped into his arms. So there's a sense here of great peril, perhaps danger, that's coming on to Daisy. 
Well, they all get in their cars and they head out. They, Tom's car, though, needs to get some gas. In Tom's car is Tom, Jordan, and Nick. The relentless beating heat was beginning to confuse me, and I had a bad moment there before I realized that so far his suspicions hadn't alighted on Tom. He had discovered that Myrtle had some sort of life apart from him in another world, and the shock had made him physically sick. I stared at him and then at Tom, who had made a parallel discovery less than an hour before, and it occurred to me that there was no difference between men in intelligence or race, so profound as the difference between the sick and the well. Wilson was so sick that he looked guilty, unforgivably guilty, as if he had just got some poor girl with child. Notice we have a common move now, common for us that Nick's doing. He's blaming something else on his confusion. Suddenly, he might not be able to rate, relate something as truthfully as he might have otherwise. And we're going to get this kind of amazing moment where Fitzgerald shows us his cards. Right? He's saying, hey, this is a parallel. You, reader, think about the similarities between Wilson and Tom. So how does it work? Well, we have Tom having sex with Myrtle, which is cheating on Wilson. We now have Gatsby with Daisy, which is cheating on Tom. So Tom and Wilson are now conflated. Wilson has been struggling with this for quite a bit longer than Tom, though, and he is now physically sick. And what did he discover? He discovered that somebody had a life apart in another world. And so he's shocked by it. A revelation has had a physical manifestation in his body. Nick now gives us a moment of profundity, and I think this is actually maybe one of the more truthful things he says. It occurred to me that there was no difference between men in intelligence or race, so profound is the difference between the sick and the well. This line obviously has a lot more to say to us today than it would have had we been studying this uh, book last year or the year before or next year even, right? Because we're in the world in which we actually recognize that the difference between the sick and the well has a lot to do with both intelligence and race, frankly, right now. Like, look at some of the statistics, see who's getting sick. Um, what this is picking up on as well is the discussions that we've had regularly with Tom and Tom's racism. And so Nick is kind of offering his own opinion on that entire discourse, uh, which is also going to be an important thing. We're not picking up, I'm not drawing attention to all of those moments, uh, but the whole race relations here is very fascinating because Notice who's going to be the, one of the main eyewitnesses at the inquest later on. We then had this odd moment where Wilson is looking sick and guilty as if he had just gotten some girl, poor girl with child. Well, to get somebody pregnant is a act of kind of virility, of creation, and Wilson's the opposite of that. He's um, a leech. Right? He wants other people's cars in order to resell them. So there's this bizarre paradox that happens in the language there. We now see Myrtle again, right? We haven't seen Myrtle since chapter two. That locality was always vaguely disquieting, right? The Valley of the Ashes, even in the broad glare of afternoon. And now I turn my head as though I had been warned of something behind. Over the ash heaps, the giant eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg kept their vigil. But I perceived after a moment that other eyes were regarding us with peculiar intensity from less than 20 feet away. In one of the wild, built windows over the garage, the curtains had been moved aside a little and Myrtle Wilson was peering down at the car. So engrossed was she that she had no consciousness of being observed and one emotion after another crept into her face like objects into a slowly developing picture. Her expression was curiously familiar. It was an expression I had often seen on women's faces, but on Myrtle Wilson's face, it seemed purposeless and inexplicable until I realized that her eyes, wide with jealous terror, were fixed not on Tom, but on Jordan Baker, whom she took to be his wife. All of this emphasis on visibility culminates in a mistaken identification. There's a sense that you cannot trust your eyes that happens here. So we've had Dr. Eckelberg a few times looking down, you've seen what he sees. Uh, vigil is an interesting word because the chapter is going to end with Gatsby keeping a vigil. So you can think about the efficacy of vigilance here. Uh, and then we have the other eyes, which are Myrtle's, and then we transition into actually discussing Myrtle. And notice that uh, Nick is kind of emphasizing this idea of slow process of thought on her. So she had no consciousness and uh, emotions are 
creeping into our face like objects in a slow developing picture, right? If you've ever made a Polaroid and you have to whip it back and forth until it develops into a photo, that's kind of what's going on here. So we have, it seemed kind of accidentally introduced Myrtle, but she's going to be here again in a moment. However, um, as we shift over that page break, we have another encounter and another payoff of repetition. Remember all those times that Gatsby has been running around calling people old sport? Well, Tom finally calls him out on it. What is? All this old sport business. Where'd you pick that up? Now, see here, Tom, said Daisy, turning around from the mirror. If you're going to make some personal remarks, I won't stay here a minute. Call up and order some ice for the mint julep. As Tom took up the receiver, the compressed heat exploded into sound, and we were listening to the portentous chords of Mendelssohn's wedding march from the ballroom below. Here is Tom's accusation that Gatsby has picked up his language. He didn't gain it naturally from birth, hence um, what we were talking about with Daisy's voice being full of money. No, instead he's affecting it. He's putting these things on, and uh, Tom is tired of it, so he tries to make a conflict. However, Daisy's diffusing it asking for some ice, right? With all this heat, you then have ice. Uh, it's almost also important that she's turning around from a mirror, but we don't have time to talk about that. And here's our first moment of a small explosion. The compressed heat exploded into sound, all right? So remember, all this energy that we're building up, you gotta put it somewhere. Here we put it into the crackle of the phone. And out of this, the sound, what we hear is, Portentous chords of Mendelssohn's wedding march. All right, everything here can kind of be broken down. Portentous means full of portents, which means full of kind of doom and gloom about the future. Everything seems to be very indicative of what's going to happen, and it's not going to be happy. Then we have a wedding march. Well, what we're about to transition into is a discussion of, Gats of um, Gatsby's love for Daisy, Daisy's love for Gatsby, but most specifically about Tom and Daisy's wedding. Kind of the major conflict here that arises around the Plaza Hotel is generated because of the minor character Blocks the lock scene. So right now I want to talk about uh, how you undergo a minor character analysis. This is a technique that you can take with us and every single thing, take with you in every single thing you ever read. Right? If there's ever a minor character and you're struggling to figure out what to write your paper about, look at that person's lines, concentrate on them, and then apply it to everything else. So as with setting, figurative language, sartorial details, and various other tools that we've had, what you do is you take that element and you connect it to the argument. So here, the element is Blox Biloxi, the minor character. The argument is Gatsby's performativity of self. And so that's essentially what they're going to do. They're going to stage the entire revelation of who Gatsby is by discussing it via Blox Biloxi. Another word that you can use for this is you might think of it as a conduit, as a substitution, or as a triangulation. Those are three nice words that you could also use. Conduit, substitution, triangulation. Obviously, they have small subtleties, and you can work those out, but you might be able to apply them in different ways. So here's the first thing we learned about him. They carried him into my house, appended Jordan, because we lived just two doors from the church, and he stayed three weeks until Daddy told him he had to get out. The day after he left, Daddy died. After a moment, she added, as if she might have sounded irreverent, there wasn't any connection. Whenever somebody tells you that there wasn't any connection, unless it's E.M. Forster in Howard's End, where he'll tell you, always connect. There's a literary joke that I hope you'll get someday. You got to make this connection, right? She, like, there's no connection. Obviously, there's a connection. Sure, it might not be a connection between life and death and expulsion. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely a connection between Bloxy Bloxy and this whole other discussion, and that's what Tom is going to pick up on. Jordan smiled. He was probably bumming his way home. He told me he was president of your class at Yale. Tom and I looked at each other blankly. The Loxy? First place, we didn't have any president. Gatsby's foot beat out a short, restless tattoo, and Tom eyed him suddenly. By the way, Mr. Gatsby, I understand you're an Oxford man. Not exactly. Oh, yes, I understand you went to Oxford. Yes, I went there. A pause. Then Tom's voice, incredulous and insulting. You must have gone there about the time Biloxi went to New Haven. Another pause. A waiter knocked and came in with crushed mint and ice, but the silence was unbroken by his thank you and the soft closing of the door. 
this tremendous detail was to be cleared up at last. I told you I went there. I heard you. I'd like to know when. It was 1919. I only stayed five months. That's why I can't really call myself an Oxford man. And here's the revelation, right? Since chapter two, three, we've been building up all of these stories around Gatsby, all these gossips, all of this rumor about him being an Oxford man. In chapter four, he presented the token of himself and all of his buddies at Oxford, and now he gets called out. And it happens because of another person's lie, right? Bloxy said, president of the class at Yale. People that actually went to Yale, though, said, we didn't have a president. And at this point, because he recognizes what's going on, Gatsby gets nervous and he starts beating his foot. <laughs> and a restless tattoo. A tattoo here means a, a swift beat. You might think of a tattoo needle. That's what it actually means because it stabs it multiple times in and out. And Tom, he clocks this. And so he makes his move. Gatsby, I understand you're an Oxford man, right? Making this connection between Oxford and Yale. And then Gatsby kind of hedges, not exactly, I went there, and Tom, and this great insult, incredulous of course means um, not believing, insult means an attack, and notice we have this uh, repetition of I and prefixes, which mean against or toward. You must have gone there about the same time Biloxi went to New Haven, right? You must have been constructing your falsehood at the same time Biloxi did. I don't believe you ever went there. And we have this awkwardness with that kind of like chills the atmosphere at the same time we bring ice in and get, and then we learn a tremendous detail was to be cleared up at last, right? All of this buildup. Remember, chapters one to six have all been thrusting us forward to this chapter. And now we're clearing up these details. We're using repetition and recollection to rework everything that we know. They immediately transition into a debate um, around like trying to prove their masculinity over ideas of who does Daisy love. I want to know what Mr. Gatsby has to tell me. Your wife doesn't love you, said Gatsby. She's never loved you. She loves me. You must be crazy, exclaimed Tom automatically. Gatsby sprang to his feet, vivid with excitement. She never loved you. Do you hear? He cried, she only married you because I was poor and she was tired of waiting for me. It was a terrible mistake, but in her, in her heart, she never loved anyone except me. At this point, Jordan and I tried to go, but Tom and Gatsby insisted with competitive firmness that we remain, as though neither of them had anything to conceal. And it would be a privilege to partake vicariously of their emotions. So here's what Gatsby wants. He wants this declaration of never. He wants to elide, to erase time and bring two points of time back together again. Tom exclaims automatically, right? Automatic is kind of machine-like, an automaton, versus Gatsby's vivid, lived excitement. So we kind of have Gatsby overwhelmed versus Tom's confidence that's almost automatic. He knows his position. He's not insecure. Gatsby iterates, never loved you. You hear? She only married you because I was poor, so he kind of acknowledges the marriage, but it's a mistake. But in her heart, she never loved anyone except me. Gatsby demands to be exceptional. Jordan and Nick, they're super uncomfortable. They're like, we want to dip. But then we have Tom and Gatsby allied. They want them both to stay there with competitive firmness, right? Here's where we have our toxic masculinity coming into play. The two of them declaring, oh, we earned, we gained, we dominated the love of Daisy. Therefore, we are the superior example of what it means to be a man. Both are like not concealing anything. And then we get this alliteration of a privilege to partake vicariously of their emotions. Here we have what's called a meta literary moment because the, what Tom and Gatsby want Jordan and Nick to do is the same thing that the book wants us as readers to do to participate vicariously in the emotions of the characters. It continues. Gatsby walked over and stood beside her. Daisy. That's all over now, he said earnestly. It doesn't matter anymore. Just tell, tell him the truth, that you never loved him, and it's all wiped out forever. She looked at him blindly. Why? How could I love him possibly? You never loved him, she hesitated. Her eyes fell on Jordan and me with a sort of appeal, as though she realized at last what she was doing, and as though she had never 
all along intended doing anything at all. But it was done now. It was too late. I never loved him, she said with perceptible reluctance. Not at Capiolani, demanded Tom suddenly. No. From the ballroom beneath, muffled and suffocating chords were drifting up on hot waves of air. Not that day I carried you down to the punch bowl to keep your shoes dry. There was a husky tenderness in his voice. Daisy, please don't. Her voice was cold, but the rancor was gone from it. She looked at Gatsby. There, Jay, she said, but her hand as she tried to light a cigarette was trembling. Suddenly she threw the cigarette and the burning match on the carpet. Oh, you want too much, she cried to Gatsby. I love you. Now, isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. She began to sob helplessly. I did love him once, but I loved you too. Gatsby's eyes opened and closed. You loved me too, he repeated. Even that's a lie, said Tom savagely. She didn't know you were alive. Why, there are things between Daisy and me that you'll never know. Things that neither of us can ever forget. You likely already know what I'm going to talk about, but it's all going to be about anxieties of love and intimacy. It begins with Gatsby's language. Everything is all over. It doesn't matter anymore. Tell him the truth that you never loved him and it's all wiped out forever. This is the central goal of Nick's, of, sorry, of Gatsby's attempts here at this moment. He wants to erase that entire relationship. She, though, is blind. So you might recall what's going on with like Myrtle's looking, TJ Eckelberg's looking, but we have these, all these things are coming together, right? It's, it's making connections. Gatsby iterates, never loved him. He's like kind of on a one-track mind. And this is the moment that Daisy actually comes to a realization. Realize that last what she's doing, as though she had never, a very interesting use of never because it's done in a different way, intended doing anything at all. Remember what she said about Pammy? I hope she's a beautiful little fool. She doesn't know what's going on. That's how Daisy was trying to live her life, with no action. Suddenly, though, she's been demanded that she make an action. Tell him the truth. To tell the truth is an act, a speech act. And so she says, I never loved him. But the problem is, Tom's there still. And Tom can use his tools of memory. He comes up with Capiolani in the past. No. And then this beautiful moment, this moment of stillness, when, from the ballroom beneath, muffled and suffocating chords were drifting up on the hot waves of air. Notice this language, suffocating, drifting waves. This is the language of death and destruction, specifically death by water, which is something to keep in mind. Everything's leading somewhere, and everything's coming from somewhere else. The joy about reading Fitzgerald is he knows what he's written, and so repetition can really be emphasized. He comes up with another one. Not that day I carried you from the punch bowl to keep your shoes dry. I mean, it's amazing. Look at this. The, like, the imagery of water and waves transitions to the anecdote about the shoes dry. It's just amazing stuff. But this is too much for Daisy. She's suddenly trembling and she comes up with what is a cognitive impossibility for Gatsby. I love you now. I can't help what's past. I did love you, him, but I loved you too. This too breaks Gatsby's brain. It's impossible for him to accept that. There's not a, a, a now and a past. There is a me and a me. Daisy is saying, no, there's an in-between. That in-between is what Gatsby finds absolutely impossible to allow to exist. And his eyes open wide. You love me too? He repeats another moment of this repetition. Tom, though, had, now has the upper hand. He's won. Even that's a lie. She didn't know you were alive. And then there's a moment of brutal honesty. There are things between the two of us that you'll never know and that we can't forget, right? What makes up a human, what makes up an individual, a relationship? It's the intimacy that comes of shared experience. And Tom has said, you don't get to be a part of this. You can't erase the past. They run out in different directions in different cars. And we have a very short, only a paragraph and a half 
but it culminates in a very um, phenomenal, like, probably devastating paragraph, which is Myrtle's body. So essentially what happens, what I think happens here is all this energy from the previous six chapters, from this fight, it all culminates and the energy has to go somewhere. And the place that energy goes is actually on the female body of Myrtle, the single greatest victim of this book. Her life violently extinguished, knelt in the road and mingled her thick, dark blood with the dust. Michaelis and this man reached her first, but when they had torn open her shirtwaist, so damp with perspiration, they saw that her left breast was swinging loose like a flap, and there was no need to listen for the harp beneath. The mouth was wide open and ripped to the corners as though she had choked a little and giving up the tremendous vitality she had stored so long. Things that we're gonna pay attention to here are the, this idea of the violence and uh, the being torn, the swinging loose like a flap, and notice the choking that picks up that language of suffocation that we just had, and of course, vitality, even ripped. So we've already seen a lot of different car accidents and car crashes. I'm only gonna talk about um, two of the major ones, but there's a lot of other language that you could pick up on here. So you'll remember back in chapter three at the big party at Gatsby's, but as I walked down the steps, I saw the evening was not quite over. 50 feet from the door, a dozen headlights illuminated a bizarre and tumultuous scene, right? This is the same thing. We're having repetition again, where it's like we're always practicing for something that comes. In the ditch beside the road, right side up, but violently shorn of one wheel, rested a new coupe, which had left Gatsby's drive not two minutes before. The sharp jut of a wall accounted for the detachment of the wheel, which was now getting considerable attention from half a dozen curious chauffeurs. However, as they had left their cars blocking the road, a harsh discordant din from those in the rear had been audible for some time and added to the already violent confusion of the scene. Okay, so a lot of this is the same, only we're getting this really, really kind of bizarre, almost uncanny, which is a word that um, you should bring up maybe uh, next year. Try to talk about Freud's uncanny with your literature teachers, if they can take that anywhere. It's a really interesting literary concept. Um, so right, we get this detachment of the wheel and the single breast that's been flapped loose. It acts, I think, to kind of emphasize that Myrtle is a mechanization of plot in some ways and they lacks individuality. We, of course, also had an early, another car crash in chapter four. Tom ran into a wagon on the Ventura Road one night and ripped a front wheel off his car. So again, we're building up all of these front wheels. And if you look at the other car accidents that are mentioned, things get crushed, individual parts. But specifically, we have um, that language of ripped, which is asking us to use repetition to connect these, right? So here's a moment of triangulation where we use ripped here, ripped here, violent here to violent there to bring them all together. Something I didn't talk about, though, is all those uh, versions of vitality. If you go back to the first time we saw Myrtle, she was marked for her vitality. This leads to a brief discussion about who killed Myrtle. Tom says the goddamn coward. He whimpered. He didn't even stop his car. So Tom thinks that Gatsby was driving. Later on, Nick and Gatsby are talking outside of um, uh, Tom's house. And Nick says, was Daisy driving? Yes, Gatsby said after a moment. But of course, I'll say I was. So did this come as a surprise? Was this a revelation? Was it a plot twist even? Or did you know all along? It also raises an interesting question about who kills Myrtle. So the final scene shows us um, Daisy and Tom were sitting opposite each other at a kitchen table with a plate of cold fried chicken between them and two bottles of ale. He was talking intently across the table at her and in his earnestness, his hand had fallen upon and covered her own. Once in a while, she looked up at him and nodded in agreement. They weren't happy and neither of them had touched the chicken or the ale and yet they weren't unhappy either. There was an unmistakable air of natural intimacy about the picture and anybody would have said that they were conspiring together. So here we have this culmination of all this language of natural intimacy. They've spent these five years together. They know each other. They've kind of come to a certain amount of agreement. Um, and that's a place that Gatsby can never touch. Remember, he's outside the house. He's a, a, away from this. A few things that are also interesting here, um, this idea of the picture, I think that that picks up some of that language of Myrtle looking. And you'll remember that Tom here, sorry, that Nick is here looking in. There's also a sense that Daisy's decided to no longer be an equal, right? She's covered. The hand has fallen on her. He was talking intently across the table at her, 
right? There's this, um, the use of language there doesn't quite lead to the sense that they're conspiring together as equals. All right, so just one question for the forum. And I want you to really think about this. Like, I want you to spend some time going back over these pages, going back over this lecture, um, really try to engage more carefully than you guys have been. Why do you think Myrtle dies? And why is the language around that death so redolent of previous moments? Try to elaborate beyond one sentence. Think about these things. If you are going to blame an individual, you better think extra hard about that. All right. Everything else from here, we have two more chapters, and uh, it um, is a little bit of a denouement, but not fully. Don't worry, there's still a lot to happen.